From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And welcome back once more to the Cannabis Podcast. This is episode 81. If this is your very first visit, well, I hope you're interested in cannabis because we're going to spend the next 30 or 40 minutes talking about all sorts of cannabis things like how about a ridiculous excise tax that's being applied to every gram of cannabis in our country? It's killing craft cannabis. And there is a call now for some change in that. We'll talk about that. The wow factor increases for some cannabis gifts this Christmas for those who have a whole lot of money to blow. A BC grower has some very ambitious product plans. A deep study reveals vast differences in quality between illicit and legal cannabis. And we're going to stop in Alberta for Cultivar Corner today. This week, we taste Ogin Gasberry's number 112. All of that and more on episode 81 of the Cannabis Podcast. I got to experience something a little bit different this last week. I got invited to participate in the High Life Cup in their Battle of the Carts. Now, all of this happened at sessionhigh.life. Go to that website, check it out. And Sessions is the organization. Jamie Norris is the head of Sessions. And their whole team were very nice when they invited me over for a visit and to participate in their Battle of the Carts. Nice studio they have here in Kelowna. They are now in the process of doing head-to-head competitions between a bunch of different carts. And the two that I had were Phyto Blue Raspberry and Feathers Gorilla Skittles. Now, they ran into some problems with someone hacking into their Instagram account. So the competition at the moment, at the time that I'm recording this, maybe it'll change in the next day or so, has been suspended. Voting will happen, I suppose, at some point later. So I'm not going to sneak or tell you what the answer is and which one I picked, because that wouldn't be fair, because they haven't even aired it yet. But I had to say I had a whole lot of fun. And thanks to Jamie Norrish and the crew at Sessions for inviting me over to participate. And who knows, maybe we'll do some more in the future. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And for our first story of this episode, we are going to leafly.ca and a story written by David Brown. And a really important story, because this really has to change. The founder of a cannabis company in B.C. is trying to bring attention to an issue many in the industry say is threatening to put small cannabis companies out of business. The current federal excise tax on cannabis doesn't reflect the realities of the market, according to Dan Sutton, CEO of Tantalus Labs, a cannabis cultivator and processor located about an hour outside of Vancouver. The main issue? The excise tax is set at a flat $1 per gram rate, rather than a percentage of sales. Instead, Sutton says the tax should be based on scale, similar to how they do it in the beer industry. Canadian craft cannabis is being taxed to death, according to Sutton. That's why he is leading the charge with the campaign Stand for Craft, where people will be able to learn more about the issue and access literature and ways to contact politicians. The excise tax was established when the federal government legalized cannabis. Cannabis companies selling products into the provincial market or selling to consumers in the medical stream are required to pay a flat tax rate. Overlooking some small nuances, it roughly breaks down to $1 per gram of cannabis sold. 75% of those taxes go to the provinces, while 25% goes to the federal government. That rate was established partly because the federal government saw the average cost of cannabis at the time of legalization as being around $10 per gram. The excise tax regime as it exists today, from the beginning of legalization, has ended up taxing micros, craft, and small to medium businesses upwards of 20 to 30 percent of the top-line revenue. The problem with this, says Sutton, is that this flat rate means paying about a quarter or more of a company's revenue on their wholesale price of cannabis. Every dollar they make, they have to pay 30 points on the package before they even get a cent. Rather than a flat rate, Sutton says he'd like to see a move to a number based on the percentage of sales, paid on the consumer price rather than the wholesale price. If we want an industry that includes small business, If we want an industry that includes firms that are not subsidized by millions in shareholder investments, then we need to revise this excise now, says Sutton. We need to attach taxation to wholesale prices, a floating percent. When a producer's profit margin is only $2 to $3 a gram, that $1 excise tax can eat up 20 to 30% of the company's profits. Sutton predicts that as price continues to drop, it could amount to 50% or more of revenue. 
A sales-based sliding scale would still allow governments to bring in revenue but would not squeeze small cannabis businesses to the point of bankruptcy. A change is needed to allow those companies to make enough money to perpetuate themselves, not to get rich quick, not to blow up in an uncontrolled way, but simply to keep the lights on and expand their businesses organically. Sutton and Tantalus are not the only ones feeding the pain. Kylie Beaudry, the owner of Parkland Flower, a micro-cultivator and processor in Alberta that sells seeds, flour, and pre-rolls into several provinces, also feels the pressure. Beaudry is also the head of the Alberta Cannabis Micro License Association, the ACMLA, and she says that she and the ACMLA are on board to draw more attention to this issue. At the ACMLA, we're taking up the charge with Dan, says Beaudry. A lot of it is putting our voices together as a group. I think that's going to be key. She says her focus is primarily on politicians at all levels, helping them understand that this is an issue that affects small businesses in their writings. It's about the local politicians. We need to get them behind us. With municipal elections happening now in Alberta, this is a good time to speak to the candidates and ask what their thoughts are. And that is definitely an area that we want to see some change in. So good on Dan Sutton and the folks at the ACMLA for proposing that we need some change to the excise tax. I mean, seriously? <laughs> I thought we wanted this this industry to succeed, but so many things have been put in place to ensure that it fails. And, and this is one of them. We need to change this or this is not going to go the way we want it to. And now let's spend a couple of moments in the lap of luxury and imagine what it might be like if, and, and perhaps you are one of those people that just has vast amounts of money burning in your pockets and you have nothing better to do than splurge on extravagant cannabis gifts. Well, if that's the case, here's the story for you. This is a story from 420intel.com. Cannabis products up the wow factor for the holidays. How about a $10,000 stash box or a joint wrapped in 24 karat gold? Those are two of the items that are on the high-end cannabis shopper's gift list this holiday season, according to MG Magazine, a trade journal that tracks trends in the cannabis industry. With the holidays fast approaching, MG identified fall's hottest and most innovative cannabis products for every type of consumer. Luxury cannabis accessories brand Freem, indeed, is trending for its $10,000 alligator skin joint carrying case a piece of exquisite craftsmanship for those interested in the ultra-pricey Nectar B bedazzled a 095 gram joint with 24-karat gold leaf paper for consumers who like making a statement. Hitoki reimagined the cannabis pipe with a laser-activated combustion system that offers cleaner smoke and truer flavor while removing the need for a lighter or a hemp wick. All three companies are relative newcomers to the industry, and MG's editors, who see hundreds of products a month, were bowled over by the ingenuity and creativity in the new releases. Stocking a cannabis retail operation isn't easy, said Kathy Brewer, editorial director at Inc. Media, MG Magazine's parent company. Retailers try to offer something for every demographic, and that's a Herculean task, made more difficult by the absence of trade markets like other consumer packaged good industries enjoy and the suspension of trade shows during the past 18 months. So MG's editorial team evaluated a mountain of new-to-the-market products over the past few months to provide retailers a look at what consumers will find intriguing this season. The resulting list of 34 products provides some insight into what the future may hold for cannabis consumption across all categories, price points, and demographics. More immediately, the curated selection will help retailers prepare for a period that historically has a huge impact on their annual revenues, over the past four years, 46% of the top 10 sales days in cannabis fell between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. And while that certainly had a focus on the U.S., I find it very interesting to see what's going to happen in the Canadian market in terms of some unique cannabis items that are going to be available for sale this Christmas and holiday season. Who knows? You might be able to add some ho-ho-ho to your toke-toke-toke. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And the next story I want to touch on, I literally am just going to touch on. I'm not going to cover the the whole thing in depth because it is huge. It's from the New Brunswick Research and Productivity Council. And they have done a comparative study with a suite of chemical and microbial contaminants in legal and illicit cannabis. Now, I have posted the link to this entire article back at CannabisPodcast.com. So I encourage you to read it, especially if you... <laughs> If you have still been in disbelief that, that there's reason to move to the legal world, 
in terms of cannabis safety and, and the product that you're getting. There's some surprising results in this document, but where I wanted to focus on was kind of right in the middle when they're talking about edibles and cannabis edibles and their potencies and how accurate the potency ranges were in terms of their testing. With respect to cannabis edibles, the regulations specify different tolerance limits based on the amount claimed to be in the product. An edible cannabis product with a claimed potency between 2 mg and 5 mg of THC must be within 80% and 120% of the claimed amount. For products containing more than 5 mg of THC, the label must be within 85 and 115% of the claimed amount. Potency claims could not be evaluated for some of the illicit products due to lack of clarity on the label. For example, one claim to have 68 mg of THC per serving and 68 pieces per pack. However, there were only 5 pieces in the pack. Another claim was 10 pieces and a total of 500 mg of THC in the pack. However, there were only 5 pieces. So for those reasons, accuracy claims for those potencies could not be determined given that it was unclear what the claim was. Accuracy of potency claims for legal products could all be calculated and range from 67% to 105%. Interestingly, one was least accurate in potency claims and had a package date of over a year old by the time it was analyzed. For this reason, it may be beneficial to consider guidelines to address shelf life, stability testing of this type of product in the future. It was also noted that illicit edible packages were non-compliant with cannabis regulations. They did not have a security feature, were colorful, contained illustrations of well-known cartoon characters, and imitated popular brands of candy products. One of the intentions of regulated packaging is to reduce risk of underage Canadian cannabis consumption by making the product less enticing. The illicit product packages did not meet these expectations. Illicit cookie and cereal bar products that claimed to contain high levels of THC contained only a fraction of what was claimed. Lack of production details meant it could not be ascertained whether these products originally contained the claimed THC and degraded, or whether the THC was never the amount claimed. Regardless of rationale for the discrepancy, consumers who purchase these products believe they contain these claimed levels of THC, and this could prove to be problematic for a consumer who is determining their optimal dosage given they would be applying inaccurate information for this determination, and as we all know, that could result in a heavy, heavy green out for someone. So there is a ton of detail in that article, and some of it a little bit surprising in terms of what they were finding in some of those samples, especially in some of the weed samples. So have a read for it yourself. You you may be surprised and you may change your opinion about legal cannabis. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Cultivar Corner, Cultivar Corner, oh yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we are finally getting around to the gift that I received earlier this year from my friend Kevin, who's out of Alberta, happened to be in the Okanagan in the summer, and decided to gift me some Ogen Gasberries number 112. Cool part of this is this is a strain that's not available in BC, unless somebody drives across the border and gives it to you. <laughs> then I guess it is available in BC. So the first package that I've ever opened that had the Alberta duty stamp on it. And, oh, there's a definite lot of gassy notes in this one. So this is from Ogen, and you go to their website, which is at ogencannabis.com, and the first thing you see is their opening line, which is, it's not about the destination, it's about the trip. And we're about to find out the validity of that statement. And then, of course, I go to their premium flower page, which is where I'm going to get more details on my Gasberries number 112. And there it is. Indica dominant. Descends from a lineage of sour diesel. Yeah, there's definitely the sour elements there. And those gassy notes. OG Kush and Blueberry. Gasberries number 112 is a potent indica dominant strain. The specialized phenotype was selected and named for its rich berry and gasoline mixed aroma and flavor. And it's interesting, when you take gasoline, the, the diesel smell, and mix it with some berries, and you get a surprisingly attractive combination smell. Really nice THC on this guy. Let's see what it's sitting at on the package I have. Sitting at 18.7. Now, are they showing me any terpenes? Aw, oh, 
No terpenes are noticed on the package. Do they give me any terpenes? Thankfully, I knew they would somehow. <laughs> on the website, I see the terpene profile, and we have alpha pinene. That is definitely the most prominent. Piney and earthy. Beta myrcene, herbal and earthy. Beta pinene. So not only alpha, but also beta pinene, more herby and woody. And then beta caryophylline, spicy and peppery. So we have a whole bunch of beta terpenes. It's going to be interesting to see what that terpene profile does for us. So let's take a peek at the buds. Now, Ojin, one of the LPs that is using these little plastic containers for their weed, I'm not honestly a big fan. I mean, they're one of the easiest containers to open, so I'll give them props for that. But I don't think it really serves the cannabis well, sitting inside all that plastic. I mean, there's some nice flavor notes on here. As I said, there's lots of gassiness, a fair amount of berries. And when I look at the flower itself, pull out my little juniors loop, and let's take a peek and see what the trichome fields are like. Uh-huh. Oh, fairly fast. Oh, there's a lot of clear truck combs in here. That kind of surprises me a little bit. There's an awful lot of clear trichomes in here, which may be their, their point. Maybe this one is particularly uh, potent when the trichomes are still not at the milky stage. I'm, I'm hardly seeing any amber, which surprises me a little bit. All right, with that kind of a setup, I think we better get down to tasting and see what this tastes like. Now, do I get more of those flavor notes as I break up the bud? Oh, yeah, I definitely do. Kind of sticks to the fingers as well. So let's grind up enough to do that proverbial joint and to fill up the Crafty Plus. And let's give Gasberry's number 112 a ride. Hoping it is, as promised, a fairly heavy indica. Once more, it's a Friday night, end of a week. <laughs> and I'm looking for a real good buzz as I get set to do the rest of this episode of the Cannabis Podcast. I often start with Cultivar Corner to give me the kind of the motivation to get through it. Sometimes I'll do the Cultivar Corners as a separate entity at different parts of the week once I get some weed or, or something like that. It, it doesn't always flow one after the other, but it looks like this episode, it's going to flow one from the other. We'll do Cultivar Corner, take a little break while we let that high envelop, <laughs> and then we'll get to the stories for today's episode. So... I have, oh, oh, wow. Lots more flavor notes with the grinding. Mmm, especially more of that gassy note. So let's pop some in the Crafty Plus and get that turned on for our hint of the full flavor from Gasberry's number 112. And once again, I want to thank Kevin. Kevin, my buddy from Alberta who gifted this to me. He's been a listener of the podcast for uh, quite a while, and interestingly enough, uh, he was having a chat in his store. The Ogen rep happened to be by, and he mentioned that he had gifted the guy who does the cannabis podcast some weed. And this rep said, oh, you mean Gary? <laughs> Which I thought was really cool, because that just means that the you were all spreading the word. You're spreading the word amongst your friends who enjoy cannabis and love learning and, and talking about cannabis <laughs> ad infinitum. <laughs> And I have been known to do that. <laughs> All right, my talking is just about done. We're just about ready to taste. The roll is going into the joint. Seal that puppy. And because the joint is finished first, that's where we're going to start. So this is, again, from Ogen, Gasberries number 112. And the THC on this guy, once more, is at 18.7%. <laughs> Kind of coincidental, just as I light that joint, the Crafty Plus signals that it's ready to go as well. So first hit on the joint. Smooth taste, not bringing on any cough, which I always appreciate in cannabis. And what's the ash looking like? Looking pretty good, pretty gray. Not seeing any black develop. It's hanging on nicely. And there is hit number three. And interesting enough, as hit number three hit the back of my throat, 
there was that first hint of some happy eyes going on there. It seems a bit early to me, but all accepted if it wants to come to the fore. Let's take a taste of the vaporizer. See what the taste of Ogen Gasberries number 112 is. Oh, heavy on the gas. That sour diesel is really coming through. Oh, absolutely. Getting a lot of the herbal notes, which I guess is no surprise with the beta myrcene and the beta pinene both having some herbal elements to it. Not picking up a lot of pine. Not a little bit of woodiness, I guess, there. Now, here I am double fisting again. <laughs> I have the crafty in my right hand. In my left hand is the joint, which I have now just relit. And we've had a few hits on this now. Expecting to see something come rumbling up through the endocannabinoid system sometime soon. And I can, I can feel there's some hints of it. It's not coming on gangbusters. But as I've experienced lately... There seems to be a lot of weed these days that the more you smoke, the higher and, and harder the high is, as opposed to some of the stuff we used to get. You, you, you couldn't smoke anymore, get any higher. It just kind of did nothing more for you. So I'm, I'm feeling a buzz off of the Ogen Gasberries number 112. Mm -hmm. There's a nice sense of euphoria over me right now. A little bit of that movement between my shoulder blades. Kind of feeling some of that body relaxation kind of move in. Mm. Oh, yeah, now it's it's coming on a bit heavier now. Mm -hmm. Which is what I was hoping for. <laughs> always hoping for that. Isn't that what we're always hoping for? <laughs> it is just for that weed to just overtake you and go, okay, here's what you've been looking for. Here, have a high. Hmm. <laughs> And chances are I've edited out the coughing fit that occurred a couple of minutes ago. Because <laughs> I don't think that's something that you necessarily need to listen to and your speakers don't need to crackle with the sound of a heavy cough. That could be as a result of the fact that I'm coming off of a bit of a cold I've had for the last week or so. We'll write that off to that. I don't think it was the weed. It didn't. Uh, it wasn't harsh in the joint at all as it was going in. And definitely no harshness in the vaporizer. I'm kind of feeling that this might also be a bit of a creeper. It may kind of get a little stronger as we go along. So if you haven't had a chance yet, and you are in Alberta where you can get it, <laughs> maybe in some other provinces as well. Do they tell me that? Final thoughts? No. <laughs> I just went to the bottom of the page <laughs> at ogencannabis.com, and their final thoughts are, Exhale at the end of the day and imagine you're hanging out in a Swedish Nordic hot pool. While elves from the Lord of the Rings spoon feed your birthday cake sprinkled with unicorn dust. I suspect they were pretty stoned when they wrote that. <laughs> that sounds like something that would come out of the mind of a stoner and think this is absolutely brilliant. Which many things we come up with are, aren't they? Until the next morning when we review them and perhaps they weren't quite as, weren't quite as brilliant as we thought. There it is. If you have not tried it and you are in Alberta and in a province that is accessible, you may want to give a taste with the gas berries number 112. Mmm. Very gassy. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And my thanks to David Wiley and all of his crew at OkanaganZ.com or TheOunce.ca, whichever you would prefer, uh, because the Okanagan Z is the source for the next story. And David's been doing a fantastic job of covering cannabis, especially local here in the Okanagan Valley. And he has been covering this company ever since they started. Speakeasy Cannabis Club plans to launch premium flower value offerings and extracts over the next 12 months. The Rock Creek-based company says its brands will represent the company's agricultural roots, respect the culture, and sell at a price that will rival competitors and the black market. Now that's what we've been waiting for, somebody coming into the market with statements like that. 
We're excited about taking the next step with our business after receiving the sales license for extracts in early September 2021. The company has started the brand budding journey, says founder Mark Gein. We're looking forward to releasing the brands that tell the story of an authenticity within an emerging industry that is dominated by too many faceless offerings and has yet to really capture the true cannabis enthusiasts from the black market. Speakeasy says it plans to introduce four high THC legacy strains with THC levels over 25%, release extracts targeting the expanding dab culture, including live resin vape, live resin sugar, terp sauce, diamonds, and other types of high THC extracts, and hit the value side with outdoor-grown flour, pre-roll, and extracts. We understand that there are still huge gaps in product offerings, and some sections of the industry have yet to emerge, says Keen. While the industry talks about a glut of products, we see this as a result of poor quality, backlog of stale products, and a lack of product innovation. This is Cannabis 2.0, and since day one, we have always stated that this is an industry that's no different than wine. It's agriculture as an art. And kudos to Speakeasy Cannabis Club. I really love to hear things like that from local organizations, local businesses, talking about the future of cannabis. And again, kudos to WokanaganZ.com for covering it and giving us all the news about those stories. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And because we haven't done one for a while, I think we're going to end this episode with a story. And we're going way back. Now, most of the stories I tell in this context are stories revolving cannabis use, purchase, finding it, consuming it, (laughs) obtaining it, and all the stuff we used to have to do before you could walk into a store and just walk up and say, can you give me a quarter ounce of some indica? It was a different world back then. This particular story involves a good friend of mine. His name is Gord. I unfortunately haven't seen Gord in a number, number of years, but when he lived here, he was growing and Boy, did he grow some really fine weed. And some of the weed he grew was a a strain of chemo, and it came from some clones that came from another buddy named Horace. And Horace was a renowned grower in the Kootenays. Uh, If anybody happened to spend any time in the Nelson area, you'll probably recognize that name. (laughs) Gord was growing here uh, in the Okanagan. And as you are aware, if you've listened to the podcast at all, I used to work in broadcasting. I was in radio. And at this time, I was a producer. I wasn't on air. I was just producing commercials and, and other content. And in my lunch hours, as I think I have revealed in, an, in other stories, I spent a good time in those lunch hours trying to purchase some cannabis and get ready for my enjoyment that evening or perhaps even at that time. <laughs> so this is one of those stories. This was Gord was growing some of Horace's chemo. So Horace supplied the clones. And he was actually over for a visit. He was visiting Gord when I dropped by the house one afternoon, and it was probably around 1230, right in that noon hour. And Horace and Gord, and I think there might have been two other people there as well. I can't remember their names. They were chatting, and I came over to probably buy an ounce or or something like that. Gord was preparing it, and they said, well, do you you want to have a toke while you're here? And I kind of chuckled. I said, well, that's kind of a silly question. Of course I do. (laughs) And so they rolled up, and they used to roll some pretty big fatties. And this was a real fat doobie of some pretty fine chemo. And I'm talking really skunky stuff. God, you could smell this stuff from a block away. Boy, I haven't smelled anything like that in years. It was incredibly skunky and stinky and potent. And we passed this joint around, as I say, I think there was a total of five people. It went around the circle twice and everybody else stopped. I didn't. (laughs) I just kept hauling on that joint until it was pretty well finished because that's what I do. (laughs) I put it out and did my deal and and paid Gord the money and got up and drove back to work and and went to work that afternoon. And I saw Gord a couple of days later (laughs) and he said, Horace, who of course had been around weed and a lot of people for a long time, he could not believe that I finished that joint, got up, drove back to work, and worked that afternoon after consuming the weed that he had originated. It was a pretty fine weed, but I somehow managed to control those types of things when I need to at certain moments in my life, and it was a blast. I had a lot of fun at it, and that is a really fun memory for me. 
If you ever have a comment about anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, you can send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. That's also where you'll find all the links to anything that gets talked about on each episode. And you know what? We are into October, and that means October 17th, 2021 is on the horizon. What's that, Mark? Three years of legal cannabis. I'm curious. What do you think's been accomplished? What do you think's the best thing about legal cannabis three years into it? Send a note to info at cannabispodcast.com. I'd be curious to see what kind of reactions we get across the country. And that wraps it up for episode 81 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Cannabis Podcast.